Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying. Uh, the next person uh, speaking is another student of mine, Shantavius Wimberly. Uh, besides being a uh, full-time student, he is a preacher. And another thing he does is he goes around and gives Martin Luther King speeches uh, on, on a on the regular, and when he told me that, I told, I asked him, please come to the symposium. So, without further ado, Shantavius Wimberly. You all doing okay? Yeah. There's always been this myth about black Southern preachers. Some say that black Southern preachers are, are a little long-winded. Some black preachers are long-winded, but I promise you, I won't be up here that long. If, but let's, let's get it started. I want to ask you a question, and that is, what's in your life's blueprint? Whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint, and that blueprint serves as the guide, as the pattern, and a building is not well erected without a good, solid blueprint. Now, each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives, and the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. I want to suggest some things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one, in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, and your own somebodyness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you're nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth and always feel that your life has the ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you, should, you must have the basic principle of determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavors. You're going, you're going to be deciding as the days, as the years, as the months unfold exactly what you will be doing in your life and what your life's work will be. Set out to do it well. And as I say to you, my young friends, doors are opening to us. Doors of opportunity that were not open to your mothers and your fathers. And the great challenge facing you will be to be ready as these doors open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essay, is said in a lecture in 1871, if a man can write a better book, or preach a better sermon, or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. This hasn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. And so I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil, I would say to you, don't drop out of school. I understand the sociological reasons, but I urge you that in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you're forced to live in, stay in school. And when you have discovered what you will be in life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Don't just set out to do such a great job, but set out to do such a good and great job that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. And even if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, go out and sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. 
sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to stop and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley, but be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. And if you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail, but just be the best at whatever you are. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for that wonderful, wonderful Martin Luther King rendition. Uh, what I'm doing is a little bit different. It's hard to follow that, that divine inspiration. But I wanted to uh, talk about uh, the waves of feminism. <coughs> and uh, this is something that... Uh, Let's see, that uh, I uh, presented at uh, the, the mini global conference on uh, global violence. Let's see, find it here. Uh, so, oh, sorry, here. Oh, there it is. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So what is going on with the concept of feminism? This is something that has been in the works since time immemorial. Not a lot of people realize that there have been officially three waves of feminism going all the way back to 1790 with uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, and uh, she wrote a book, two books actually, Vindication of the Rights of Men, uh, 1790, and Vindication, <coughs> excuse me, of the Rights of Women, uh, Woman, 1792. Uh, Mary Mary Wollstonecraft it was the mother of Mary Shelley, the woman who wrote Frankenstein, for those of you who, you know, who like your trivia. Uh, poor Mary died in childbirth, giving birth to Mary of an infection, probably because the doctor didn't wash his hands between uh, patient visits. And that was very common back in those days. Uh, let's see, so the first wave lasted from the 1790s to the 1960s because there was a couple, uh, at least a hundred year dip there. And this was the concept of having right, the right to vote and having the same rights as men. And of course it interacted with abolutionary, abolitionism and uh, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth were big abolitionists, especially Sojourner, and of course Harriet was uh, on, the, on the Underground Railroad. Uh, a couple other major figures were Susan B. Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the first wave was criticized for looking at just uh, mostly issues of middle class white women, okay? Now, um, Sojourner had uh, a speech that she gave at the 1851 Women's Convention called Ain't I a Woman? And this is a piece of that. That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and have to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man, and when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? 
I have borne 13 children and seen most of them sold out to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. Ain't I a woman? Gives you an idea of some of the things that were going on. Um, and here are a couple of Susan B. Anthony quotes. I declare to you that women must not depend on the protection of men, but must be taught to protect herself, and there I take my stand. The day may be approaching when the whole world will recognize women as the equal of men. Three, there will never be complete equality until women themselves help to make laws and elect lawmakers. Okay, it gives you an idea of some of the things. Now, second wave feminism, some of you may be familiar with this. This was roughly from the 1960s to the 1980s. We have Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, the Kambahi River Collective. Now, I don't know if you know about the Kambahi River Collective. They were a group of uh, black lesbians back in the 70s and 80s who came up with their own collective. Now, it was called the Kambahi River Collective because of Harriet Tubman. Uh, some of you may not be aware that be besides, you know, working on the underground railroad, freeing slaves and being a union spy, Harriet Tubman led the first female union raid on the Kabahi River in South Carolina. And she was successful. That's why she's one of my personal heroes. <laughs> now, one of the things about the second wave movement, it was concerned with the women in the workplace and, of course, reproductive rights. You know, one of the things that we should have control over as women and as human beings in general, we should be able to have control over our reproductive rights, which is something that is actually coming to the forefront again with the major cuts to Planned Parenthood. Okay, uh, because uh, what was going on during the second wave, there was still a criticism on women in color and les uh, women in color and lesbian women not being part of the mainstream movement, and because of these issues were ignored, uh, uh, minority women, women of color, and lesbians, and some who were both women of color and lesbians, they started splintering and creating their own feminine feminist groups at this time, and uh, one of the major people of uh, the second wave movement the, or radical feminism is Betty Friedan and she wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique uh, about middle class white women. I actually got to meet her. She wasn't, let's just say she wasn't a very nice person, never said a word. She said her speech and when she was giving out autographs, everybody, oh, we love you and she didn't say a word. I don't know, maybe she was in a bad mood. So, and here's a quote from uh, the Kambahi River Collective from 1974. We believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in black women's lives as are the politics of class and race. We also, uh, also often find it difficult to separate race from class, from sex oppression, because in our lives they are most often experienced simultaneously. We know that there is such a thing as a racial sexual oppression which is neither solely racial nor solely sexual. E.g., the history of black women, of rape of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression. Now, uh, I don't know if any of you have watched the Hidden Colors uh, video DVD series. Uh, Hidden Colors 4 just came out. And, um, and it, it covers a very delicate subject that not a lot of people were aware of or tried to, you know, uh, keep under the table, which is the rape and sexual assault of black men by uh, their slave owners. And, oh, yeah, uh, they would take the biggest, strongest black male um, 
and rape him in front of everybody to the white, uh, white slave owner would rape him in front of everybody to show who was boss. You don't hear that, unfortunately. And of course, it's something I had to bring up because any type of oppression is wrong. And if we bring this stuff out to the surface, it's something we can deal with. And maybe that's why there's so much homophobia in the black community. And this is Gloria Steinem, who is still doing her thing. A feminist is anyone who recognizes the equality and, few, and full humanity of women and men. So a guy can be a feminist. Uh, at my alma mater, Illinois State University, there was a group called Men Against Rape. So you can still be a strong man and still be down for women. Okay. Uh, here's Betty Friedan from The Feminine Mystique, 1963. Over and over again, stories in women's magazines insist that women can know fulfillment only at the moment of giving birth to a child. They deny the years when she can no longer look forward to giving birth, even if she repeats the act over and over again. In the feminine mystique, there is no way for a woman to dream of creation or of the future. There is no other way she can even dream about herself, except as her children's mother, her husband's wife. Now, uh, I'm not married and I don't have children, but I'm sure that you know the women who are married and or have kids love being a wife and or mother or both, depending on your circumstances. But we all know that is not the sum of your parts. You are more than that and you can be more than that if that's what you choose to be. Uh, the third wave is what we are considered to be in now, and that started in the early 1900s. And the term was coined by the feminist Rebecca Walker, who actually spoke here uh, five years ago, this month. Um, and she is Alice Walker's daughter. Y'all know Alice. The color purple, for example. Now, it focuses on the history or rewriting of history, which Rosanna is going to speak about at 11. Uh, it's the concept of where these splinter groups of women of color and lesbian feminist groups start coming together and realizing that they are in the same struggle. And it tries to bridge the gap between all these different things about race, sexuality, and gender. Now, a big part of this, besides Rebecca is Eve Ensler, uh, the woman who uh, created the vagina monologues. And we actually put that on here at ASU for like five years in a row. And the proceeds went to the Liberty House of Albany, the uh, domestic violence shelter, the only one in southwest Georgia, by the way. It covers 17 counties. Okay, so it's very important to talk about these issues. Now, uh, this is Eve Ensler. When you rape, beat, maim, mutilate, burn, bury, and terrorize women, you destroy the essential energy on the planet. You know, mm, something to think about, right? <coughs> and this is Rebecca Walker from I Am the Third Wave. I am ready to decide, as my mother decided before me, to devote much of my energy to the history, health, and healing of women. Each of my choices will have to hold to my feminist standard of justice. To be a feminist is to integrate an ideology of equality and female empowerment into the very fiber of my life. It is to search for personal clarity in the midst of systemic destruction, to join in sisterhood with women when often we are divided to understand power structures with the intention of challenging them. She said that back in 92. Now this is something that I have called and we called it a couple years ago at one of the symposiums the concept of the fourth wave and this is the one I say that we are living in now some people may agree or disagree with me I call it global feminism because basically that's what it is it unofficially officially you know deals with um, the 
what was going on with women from around the world, especially with regards to underdeveloped countries. And it recognizes that women and men, regardless of background, are in the struggle together. So it's not, not just about women's rights, uh, it's about men, uh, male rights, rights of sexuality, rights of race. And, and of course, it's very inclusive of the LGBT community. Now, this is the concept of fighting for equal rights in uh, various countries. And I don't know if you realize this, there are currently 22 women leaders of various countries. Um, and a lot of them, in fact, are in parts of Africa, have most of the political leaders in Africa are women, but you don't hear that. Women's rights are human rights. Now this is something that of course is very close to my heart. We are living in the United States of America, which is supposed to be the best country on the planet. Not. We don't have equal rights for women here. Y'all know that, right? Um, and that's one of the things, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment in 1980, lost out by one vote. And that's why uh, women are still not getting equal pay and equal opportunity. Um, women in general make about 70 cents on the dollar to men. Uh, minority women uh, I think African American women make about 60 cents on the dollar. Latino women, maybe, I think it was like 40 cents on the dollar. Now, yes, we have a president at this point who does not seem uh, conducive to that concept. Now, think of it this way, everyone, you know, especially with us women, regardless of race, under the Constitution, one of, you know, the amendments, we are equal with regards to race, but we are not equal with regards to uh, our gender or gender or biological sex. Half equal to me is not equal. Okay. Um, now, I'm only one person out of billions on this planet. And let me tell you, you know, the, what, what is going to happen in the future starts with us and you do not have to have a great big um you know pulpit you don't have to uh give, give speeches everywhere just standing up for yourself and recognizing your value on a daily basis is enough and and to know that you do not have to put up with uh with bad treatment from anybody Okay, so that's some of the things I wanted to talk about, especially with what's going on with this year's theme, the personal is political. We are here, we, we've been doing this, this is our ninth annual one, and I wish I could say things have gotten better, <laughs> you know. Um, they did get better un under the Obama administration, but I think we're going to have a lot of backlash here. And I, as a, um, I was talking to a friend about this a while ago, um, she says that everything is a lesson or a blessing. So we have to figure out if it's something wrong, what is the lesson, what do we learn from this? And that's one of the things um, I keep thinking about a lot. What do we need to learn about from this current administration? Why are things the way they are? And she also said that we have to get creative if we want to overcome our obstacles. So. Uh, especially for you young people who are really into the social media stuff, you know, tweeting on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever, okay? You know, you can make a difference and you don't even realize that you're making it, okay? So, um...